Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to the 527th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. Have you thought about why you do what you do? This is a daily process for me, and it is the reason I put so much energy and money into producing our Urban Farm Podcast. What you may not know is that it costs $158 per episode to get you this incredible information. And as you can hear, we don't do sponsorships as we want to keep our message as clean as possible. It has always been my intent to pay for our podcast production with our online content sales, and that hasn't worked very well. So we're trying something new, and I need your help so that we can continue delivering this great content. And quite honestly, this is an easy learning-filled request. I've teamed up with some amazing gardening visionaries to host a free online edible backyard summit the week of March 23rd. When you attend, you'll get free access for the week to the knowledge of these food growing experts and have an opportunity to get your burning questions answered live. Plus, we're going to release five modules of our comprehensive Growing Through the Basics course so that you can dig deeply into the fundamental concepts that will set you up for success no matter where you're at in your food growing journey. So here's what I need. The most helpful thing you can do is to share our EdibleBackyardSummit.com page far and wide with your friends, on social media, in your garden clubs, and probably places we've never even thought about. Next, please attend the free Edible Backyard Summit. My hope is that some of you will dive in, support our work, and purchase the extended summit and learn more about gardening and creating your own edible backyard. Our intent with this edible backyard summit is for you to discover how you can truly thrive with a healthy life and get reconnected with your food while learning how to live a more self-reliant life. Feeling secure knowing that you have a food supply right in your backyard. When you attend the Edible Backyard Summit, you'll be part of a community of people from around the world that are all on a mission to make their backyards and patios into an edible paradise. Whether you're starting your first garden or maintaining an existing one, you will come out of this summit feeling revitalized and re-inspired to make growing and eating food the celebration it should be. Sign up for free by going to EdibleBackyardSummit.com or texting BACKYARD to 33444. I look forward to seeing you there. Today on our podcast, we have someone who started an urban farm to keep young in his later years. We're talking with Ray Speakman about farming instead of retiring. Ray has always been an entrepreneur at heart with a drive to affect the lives of others for the better. He grew up on a chicken farm in Cottonwood, Arizona with 5,000 chickens as well as cows, horses, and large gardens. Then in the mid-60s, he moved to Mesa with his parents where he met and married his wonderful wife. After a series of different businesses and eight children, he ended up working for an international plant nutrition manufacturing company as their VP of marketing. It was there that he fell in love with agriculture and its effect on individual lives and Mother Earth. In June of 2017, with a neighbor and a prolific gardener, Ray started an urban farm in the middle of Mesa. His family, friends, and area neighborhoods are enjoying the farm as they watch it grow and enjoy the benefits of eating the delightfully delicious and healthy food. Welcome to the show today, Ray. Are you ready to rock? I'm ready to rock. Excellent. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at today? Absolutely. It's been a long path, so I'll make, try to make it as short as possible. But, uh, you know, I've always loved just creating businesses. I've had a number of, uh, number of them through the years. You know, I started, my main focus in life was construction. I just wanted to build things. But I've had the opportunity to... You know, be in furniture sales. I've, when I was a young man, and then I grew into going into construction. And I moved to Missouri for a while and, and tried my hand at working there and met some wonderful people. But through the years, I came back and started my own construction company and I had my own motivational company. Wow. And I've then started working for a development company and built a um, shopping center in North Scottsdale. And from there, I was let go, and and I went into business with my son. We bought a marketing company, 
And back in 2011, we started doing marketing. And so at the ripe old age of 55, I changed occupations from construction to marketing. Oh, nice. And, and uh, it, it was exciting. You know, I, I, I worked construction with my father for many years and now I've had the opportunity to work with my son in marketing. And we were purchased by a company called Biohumanetics. And they're an international nutrition company, and they brought us in as the in-house marketing team. And that's where I really began to fall in love with agriculture. I saw what was going on and, and the way and, and their vision of, of really affecting the way agriculture works. They're a very, you know, earth central and soil and plant nutrition. They're not a we're in a typical fertilizer company, and their vision was really to change the way agricultural works today and get away from the, you know, the harsh chemicals and so forth and so on. And I fell in love with it and I saw the effect that they were having. And back in 2017, I've, I've watched my neighbor grow f his gardens for years and he's done absolutely wonderful with it. And I thought, you know, we need to do something together. And so I went over and chatted with him and, and he had been having the same thoughts. And so we said, well, let's do this. Wow. And so in the middle of 2017, we found a neighbor who had a backyard and a side yard that wasn't being used. And he said, go for it. And we started. And here we are two and a half years later and just loving it. Nice. Well, and on your Facebook page, there is that you standing there with two big bunches of celery? No, that's actually my partner, James Carroll. He's, uh -huh. again, he's the magic behind all the growing, but uh, yeah, that's that's my partner. Wow. Those are quite large celeries for Phoenix, <laughs> Arizona. <laughs> yes, they are. And, and the fun thing is they were absolutely delicious. Nice. Well, of course, because we're growing it ourselves. That's right. So is this something you do full time now? It is. Back in, in just a month and a half ago, the first part of November, there were some changes in the company I was working for, and they gave me an early retirement. And I said, you know, <laughs> I know what I want to do. <laughs> right. Wow. So you obviously find it satisfying. What's it doing for you? Oh, that's a great question, Greg. I mean, and, and the, the list is long. The first and foremost thing that it really does for me is just the satisfaction of, of working the soil. You know, for two and a half years, both James and I have had full-time jobs. And the time that we were able to get out in the dirt and work it and produce, you know, these vegetables, it was just a little bit of heaven, I mean, to work it before work and we'd work it after work. So we're seeing the sunrise and the sunset <laughs> nice. in, the middle, in the middle of a city. And I'm just going, I'm in heaven. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it really is that satisfaction of working the soil and then being able to give people that good food that comes from the, the soil that you're, you know, really growing it in and watching their eyes and their taste buds just come alive. And it's, it's fun. It's fun. Well, and when we're growing it locally and picking it fresh, it's tastier, right? Oh, absolutely. We have some of our customers that, again, I just kind of have to chuckle because our carrots are just, they're like eating candy. I mean, it, and, and that's a hard thing of harvesting. Sometimes out there harvesting and I'm picking and, and I'm eating and picking and, and our, our sweet peas, I eat probably more than I pick. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, and sweet peas do really well here in the wintertime. They do. They do. Yeah, they're yeah. quite prolific. Yes, and tasty. So tell me about the space where you have your farms at, because well, sure. it's, it's one single farm name, but you have yes. several backyards that you're mark that you're harvesting from. Yes, uh, the the first yard is actually James's house. Uh, in the he actually his front yard, he has a part of his front yard as part of the farm, and then in his backyard he has an area that we farm. So that's the first area, but it's a real small, not a, and, and it's amazing how much still comes off of just that small area. However, we have a neighbor about just kitty corner to where I live and down the street from where James lives, and, and he had a, uh, it's a two-lot type of a setup, and he has a house and then a a garage and so the backyard and then it's kind of a side yard so it's an l-shaped yard and we approached him and he said go for it and so uh, it's about a little under six thousand square feet that we're wow. working on there and and it's we've got it, it, we got a lot planted and a lot coming off but uh it, it's yeah, it's a good area. We we were able to, we had to go in and actually take the first four inches off because it was all Bermuda grass, and then we started building the soil and and it. Uh, we were just digging in it yesterday. We were planting some more lettuce, 
it means more spinach and the soil is just rich it's beautiful soil nice now are you on a flood irrigated lot we are it's a flood irrigation but we also well up until this summer we hand we flood irrigated and we hand irrigated Mm -hmm. and it was uh, very time consuming and so we stepped back during the summer when we had some downtime and looked at it says you know we really need to put in a sprinkler system an irrigation system and so we put in a drip system that's augmented with some sprinklers and it has been wonderful it it runs from two in the clock in the morning till five o'clock in the morning and it's all irrigated every nice. day. It's wonderful. Nice. So you have one back. Once is it your backyard? No, it's uh, James's backyard. James's backyard, and then you have uh-huh. this friend with six thousand square feet. Is, mm-hmm. Do you have another one? We do. We have a third one that we're just starting to get ready now. It's just a little over seven thousand square feet, and again, it's a friend's uh, backyard. He has about a, a 0.8 acres, and he's given us the back almost, you know, sixth of an acre back there. It's nice and square. It's it's hidden kind of in the backyard, and it's we're, we're really looking forward to it because it's going to be just a a ideal place to to really put a farm. Access is great, and there it's going to be flood irrigated and also sprinkled and drip system also. But it's going to give it's going to over double our our capacity. Wow! So you have between the three spaces, you have a quarter acre you're farming on. Yes. Uh huh. And this is production mm-hmm. farming. You're putting down rows, harvesting the food, and. Yep. And distributing it that way, how how do you distribute the food? What's the process by which you harvest it and then get it to whoever buys it? Sure. Our, our harvesting is uh, just James and I, and, and it's just all hand harvested right now. We're going to be putting in some systems to make that a little easier for us. But once it's harvested, for the last two years, we've just been taking orders from neighbors and fulfilling those orders and, and just kind of one-on-one. And it was quite cumbersome and, and a little bit strenuous. And we still do some of that. But about a, again, about a month and a half ago, we actually started a weekend produce stand. Again, at the end of our street here we have some a business that has a good a beautiful front yard that actually fronts right on stapley drive which is a main thoroughfare right. in Mesa here and he we approached him and he says yeah have at it and so every saturday morning we set up there from 7 a.m to 11 a.m wow. we put signs out and and i gotta tell you craig it's fun i mean we have people stopping in and and seeing the produce that we have sitting out there and, and just buying off the street. And then a lot of, and then most of our customers now come to us on Saturday morning right? and buy what they want and pick up and so forth. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's just fun. Uh, it's, wow. it's a highlight of, our, it's a highlight of our week, but from here, we are going to actually start a subscription service and I'm starting to work with some chefs and restaurants also to you know, actually to be able to really get even more of it out there because even with what we're doing now, we're not not selling all that we're producing. Right. It's a real challenge. Well, and such a challenge to have. Yeah. It's a good challenge. Right. Good exactly. Challenge. Wow. So, yeah. And so we're working on, on really putting that system together as far as a subscription service that we can deliver each week. And then also working with some of the local chefs here in Mesa to be able to provide them with the produce that they need and with some other opportunities. We've got a couple of other opportunities that are cooking that we're just excited about. Yeah. Wow. What inspires you to to do this? Well, the real inspiration for me, Greg, is number one, my family. I have 25 grandchildren. In fact, I, our 25th was just born four weeks ago on November 25th, a beautiful little girl. Wow. And uh, most of them, all, thank you all, and all but three of them live uh, right around us here in Mesa. And Real heaven for me is when those grandchildren come to the farm and we're able to work the soil together, to pick, to harvest, to work. That's my first driver is really my family and being able to provide them with good food and healthy food and work with my grandchildren and children. And then expanding our area of, of influence to our friends and our, you know, our extended family and then to our neighborhood. It's just fun when our neighbors come down and, and just smiling as they walk away with this good <laughs> right. food. You know, it, 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 that's the payoff. 
yeah. more than the money and everything else. That's the payoff. Yeah, it really is. One, of, you know, we do the uh, Urban Farm Fruit Tree Program here every uh, yes. January, where we do education leading up to January, and then people can come and get their trees, and it's like Christmas when they come it is. and. You know, when they come and they're picking up their stuff and they're excited, there's this level of excitement around the food that we work with that is contagious, wouldn't you say? It is. Oh, very much so. It's fun to watch some of our neighbors here and when they get it, they, they, they want to take pictures and post it and share it with their friends and families. Is that This is great stuff. You know, and, and it's fun to watch that. It's very contagious. Yeah, big time. So what is it like being a farmer? That's a great question, Greg, and have to kind of chuckle with it because as I was working for the, my previous company and I was watching these farmers, I was amazed at what they do to really bring food to the masses, mm-hmm. you know, and I mean, they are, they have to be a mathematician, they have to be a construction worker, they have to be accountants, they have to be a salesman, a marketer, businessman, right. yep. all in all in one, you, 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 you got to be a botanist, I mean, everything, you've got to be able to, to do it all. And I think that's what I like about it. The best is, you know, every day is different, different challenges, different opportunities, different people, and you get to do it all, you know, and so it, it's a, it's very challenging and sometimes very discouraging, but those, but it's so satisfying to be able to go out and to work the, the ground and the soil and then go talk to people and, and to interact with people and then come home and do the paperwork and then build your, your systems. I mean, literally build them, you know, your irrigation systems mm-hmm. and your washing stations and your greenhouses and to be able to build those. And it, it's, to me, it's heaven. I love to do it all. Nice. Nice. One of the things that I see that you're doing, you started with a small, what, 500 square foot piece of dirt and you've expanded it from there. And really in backyards, you've created this really viable farm. Tell me about how much food you can raise on it and tell me about that process. As I watched James with this little 500 square foot area that he used to just do it on his own and the amount that he would pull off of it and just share with us as neighbors and so forth, I was amazed. But then as we really got into this other backyard area and uh, started setting it up and farming it, we have rows and rows of just different vegetables that are growing. I mean, we have right now, we have sweet peas, beets, chard, carrots, cilantro, radishes, cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, lettuce, spinach, turnips, zucchinis, and more. Nice. You know, and, and it's enough to produce to where we have a hard time really getting rid of all of it. <laughs> it, it that is really one of our major challenges uh-huh. is to get to be able to get that food out to people, you know, at, before it goes bad, you know, and, and so while well, it's still fresh. And that really is one of our major challenges. So it's amazing what you can do on a little piece of ground. And maybe I can throw this in here too, Greg. I have a sister that lives in Utah and she lives not on a large prop piece of property or property or anything it's basically a standard lot but she has 21 fruit trees and a garden Uh in her in her yard and she this last fall put up over 500 bottles of jam off of her little piece of property wow and and it's an inspiration to anybody, you know, who who really wants to make a difference and grow some of their own food. You can do it no matter where you're at. And and I have a real strong testimony of that that you can do it wherever. Yeah. You know, no matter what size piece of soil you have, you can do it. Well, and that's the amazing thing that that I've discovered over the past forty years of growing food, and that's this this thing we call abundance. And what I've discovered is that this the notion of lack, not having enough, for me only lives between my ears. Because when I look at the amount of food that I can grow in a small space, it's mind-blowing. It is. It and, truly is. Yeah. And you're, you are 
challenged with that. Again, a good challenge to have, but we, that's, you know, as farmers, that's what we have to figure out. That's for sure. Cause even someone with, even if they uh, do it on their k- kitchen counters, I mean, their space, it can right. be done. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah, we had a guy on the podcast. Oh my gosh! So we're like 550 episodes in at this point, but somewhere in the 200 range, and I'll have to go back for the show notes. He wrote a book on growing a salad on your countertop. Yes, I think I listened to that. Yeah, I remember because that was very inspirational. Yeah, all about sprouts and like that. Uh huh. One of the things that is amazingly apparent with what you're doing is the level at which you have engaged the community. And that is one of the most important things we can do. Wouldn't you think? Yes, absolutely. We, you know, we actually take flyers around our neighborhood and, and drop them off and a a fun experience to show the engagement that happens. The other day I was getting ready to take off to go up to Utah uh, where my daughter had her baby. And I was out picking some uh, carrots and beets for her to take up to her and this gentleman pulls up to the side of the garden and jumps out of his car. And he says, are you a farmer? I go, yeah. And he goes, I've been getting your flyers and I've been watching this. I've been looking for a chance to catch you. I need to know how you're doing this. And he, he went into his whole life story about his grandfather and how he farmed and how he, he helped him and so forth. And he says, I got to figure out how to do this. This is so cool. And you know that I've never, it, it was just one of those experiences that was yep. so surreal that, that again, I hadn't ever met this guy, but he felt comfortable enough and we had, we had engaged him just with our flyers enough to where, you know, he wanted to know more, right. you know, and, and I think that's part of really the magic of growing and, and having, you know, local produce available is that people can then re-engage with really what food is, you know, we, we all have to eat, but most, so many people don't understand where the food comes from and what's, what it takes to really, you know, put food on the table. I was in Japan for a while and one of their traditions is you never leave a ri- a, a kernel of rice in your bowl right? because it takes, it took someone to harvest that, that kernel of rice and you're showing a disrespect if you do. And uh, I think many people have lost that connection with where their food comes from. Oh, yes. And that's important. Yeah. That's important. Interesting you should say that because one of, the, one of my habits that I've developed over the years is I don't leave food in the pan or on the plate. Yeah. You know, if I'm like this morning, I made oatmeal and I made sure I got all of it out of the pan of because I know what it takes not specifically to grow oatmeal, but I know what it takes to grow food. And it's not an easy task. Yeah. Nope. It's not. But yeah. and, and so many people have lost that connection. Yeah. And once here's here's the cool thing though. The hard part of the task is figuring out what you've done and you're sharing with people. Once you have the systems in place, then nature, you know, kind of kicks in and takes over and creates all this amazing abundance for us. Yes. And that that's the incredible thing. Yeah. So in your intro, we talked a lot about you being self-employed. And um, I started my first business in 1974 at the age of 15 years old, and I've been self-employed ever since. So we have a little bit in common there. What do you love about being self-employed? I've had the great experience of being gainfully employed by large corporations and then being on my own a number of times. And the thing that I really love about being self-employed is that I can dictate my hours during the day. I can work at midnight if I need to, or and I can work at four o'clock in the morning if I need to. You know, and then during the day, I can be, again, working where I need to. I I don't have to punch a clock. It comes with a lot of challenges because I also have to write my own paycheck. (laughs) You know, and and I have to create that that income. But it leaves you free to affect people's lives. I think that is the thing that that I enjoy most about being self-employed is that if I need to go visit a friend or if I need to just take a bundle of of, uh, fresh vegetables to someone to tell them that, hey, it's going to be okay, I can do that. Yeah. And I don't have to worry about taking off time. I can be out there and affecting people's lives when I need to. Yeah. Or just take a nap. Yes, <laughs> that's very <laughs> correct. 
Well, I love my naps. I don't get them very often, but uh, I, I'm self-employed. I work at home. So, you know, if I'm not sitting in my office working in front of the computer, I'm walking around the yard or yes. just breathing, you know? Exactly. And I think that's part of the fun of it is being out even in the, on the farm. And again, I call a farm. It's just a great big garden, but it is our farm. And, yes. and you know, I was able to sit down. Well, when I get a call, I can sit down right there in the garden and, and just sit on one of the mounds of dirt, or I can just sit there and think. Think. I've done that many times. I just sat there in the garden, just think. It's wonderful. Yeah, that is the case. Wow. And what is your vision for the future? I'm a big dreamer, always have been. And I really see us taking this to a level where I can have quite a number of my children and grandchildren work working with me in the business. Mm-hmm. That's where I want to take it uh, as the main one of my main focuses. But in doing so, affecting the lives of neighbors and friends to be able to really help them to be able to grow something on their own and learn to appreciate where their food comes from because as i see again the world where it's going today again uh, being in the biz agricultural business Mm -hmm. uh, and seeing it these huge companies are gobbling up farms and they're also taking much of that uh, land and turning it into development and so forth and we're losing a lot of our our soil that is there for growing and so really in our urban areas we got to figure it out we got to be able to grow it you know ourselves to really support the mouths that have that need to eat and it's just amazing to watch some of the, what's going on in some of the large metropolitan areas with vertical gardening mm-hmm. and hydro, hydroponic gardening and all of these are very real ways that we can feed the world and feed our neighbors and if and if calamities come we can feed ourselves our family and our neighbors yep. and that's wonderful exactly and i am a big 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 believer that urban farming growing food in the cities is one of the big solutions to our global food challenges absolutely i agree 100% you said it's just a garden you're, you call it your farm, but it's just a garden. You are doing production farming there. And one of the distinctions I made many years ago was the difference between gardening and farming. And really, it's just the way we think about it. In my mind, it's just the way we think about it. It's, you know, are you growing food for, you know, just for your family, which you could do and be calling yourself a farmer, but you're, it's the intent behind it. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's very true. And that's why, yes, I keep, I, I vacillate sometimes between calling a garden or farming because really a farmer, you're working the soil and growing food for others. You know, that's farming. And whether it be even for your family, but I, I guess I look at the size of it and say, well, because yeah, I think of farms, we're talking you know, as I look at the farmers I've worked with, they were farming hundreds of acres and thousands of acres. I don't even have an acre. And so I classify it more as a garden, but yet I am farming. And and that's the fun part about it. I got to, I got to ask you though, how many people are you feeding? Right now we're feeding, wow, on a weekly basis, we're feeding more than a hundred. Ah, boom. I love that. You know, we are. Yep. Because it goes out into families and they're fee- and you know they're feeding their families with it and yes. it's it's fun. Yes, you know, it really is. It's fun and it makes a difference in the world, giving yeah. people healthy, nutrient dense, fresh food. Yeah, I love it. Congratulations. Yep. So I'm going to shift on you, and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure, and what you might have learned from it. I've had a, a number of failures in my life because I am a, I am an entrepreneur. I've yes. even run for I've even run for political office a couple of times here in the state, and I've lost both times. But and those are failures. But I think the greatest failure that I had was last this last spring as we were approaching summer I had three totes of carrots that went bad on me mm-hmm. and I had to, and I had to throw them away and I it broke my heart yeah I looked at those and I, and I looked at those carrots and I'm saying we grew those from seeds these are my babies <laughs> you know and and we had to throw them away and I the thing I and I think that's my one of my greatest failures here recently was just that realization that I didn't take care of these babies of mm-hmm. mine, you know, these, these plants that I grew. 
And I think the thing I learned from it is that I have to be more diligent in watching and really getting the food out there to people, even if I have to give it away, yeah. which I'm happy to do, you know, to, to watch it and make sure that it, it, it is taken care of. Yeah. A well, stewardship, a kind of a stewardship. Exactly. Exactly. And there's, you know, there's food banks that you can also donate to. Have you Absolutely. looked at that? Yes. We have, in fact, I work with uh, St. Vincent de Paul. Most of the things that we, to their shelters, so they can use them now. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, we use a lot of the things that we pull up. We don't have, we haven't been able to get our composting going yet. And so we take all of our, you know, plants that we, you know, have to pull up and, uh, you know, all of our compost material we take to St. Vincent de Paul and that, and they use it until we can get our own going. So, yeah, St. Vincent de Paul is a great place. In fact, you know, That'd be a great interview for you sometime, Greg, is St. Vincent de Paul. They have a beautiful garden going. And what do you consider your biggest success? I think my biggest success also is here at the farm recently. Yeah, and I've had a number of them. I've built hotels. I've built uh, shopping centers. But my greatest success, I think, Greg, is when the, the, that first day that I had a couple of my granddaughters out on, on yes. the farm with me. And we were sitting in the rows, picking peas and pulling up cucumber plants because they, they, you know, they had they'd gone past their prime. Yep. And just working with them and having soil under our feet. And they were even working there with no shoes on, with you know, in their bare feet. And I'm just going, yeah. This is what it's all about. That, that that was my greatest success. Yes, yes. And what drives you? Those little grandchildren and and the love of being with them and my family on the farm. Wow. Yeah, it really is. It's what drives me. And leaving them a, a legacy. legacy. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You know, because it's something about there's so many similarities between between growing seeds and plants. When you watch that, you plant that seed and it comes up out of the ground and you nurture it and then it starts producing fruit and you harvest it. There are so similarities between that and growing children and to have children in there and nurturing them in the soil is just it's it's life. That's what life's all about. Nice. And if you could recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be and why? That book is probably a little bit different than what most would expect, but it's called Building a a Story Brand by Donald Miller. Yes, that is an excellent book. book. Tell me. It is, because it's all about how to, you know, really get help people to buy into your vision by making them the hero. It, it, for small farmers, it's so important to understand who you're selling to and how to tell your story to get them to be enthused about what you're doing. And they have to be the hero. And so it, Don Miller is great at setting up how to really get people to buy into what you do through story. And he has seven steps in there, and they're magic. I, I, I love to use them and and that's what we use as our basis to to create all of our content for our marketing yeah wow well and you know you've shared now for 35 minutes and i can tell you have a great story thank you and what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners well i think the advice that i would give would be kind of comes from my father. Uh, He's passed away a number of years ago, but uh, when I was a young man working with him, he had a couple of sayings, and they're kind of quirky, but one of them was, Kent is buried at the cemetery, which means you can do anything you put your mind to. Truly, don't ever say, I can't do something. If you want to start a farm, take the first step. It always takes the first step. And then he quoted also W. Clement Stone, and he said, whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe it can achieve. And I truly believe that as we, as you know, someone who wants to start an urban farm or start a garden or start even growing on their, their countertop, just start, take that first step and you'll have, you know, failures and you'll have successes, but just keep going. It's a journey. It's not a destination. It's just, you just keep going. And it's amazing as you do the magic that happens. And the deep gratitude I hear in your voice. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm so grateful for those who have set me on the path where I'm at. And I know I'm becoming an old man very quickly, <laughs> but it's a wonderful life. It is. Life is just too short. Yep. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Ray. 
Thank you for having me, Greg. It's been a privilege. You bet. And thanks for sharing an awesome story. How can our listeners get a hold of you? A couple of ways. Of course, our, our main one is our website, just greencityharvest.com. Very simple. Mm-hmm. And and we have links there that you, you know that they can get a hold of us and sign up for our, our weekly emails. Uh, also, we're on Instagram, just at Green City Harvest. Facebook, at Green City Harvest. Any of those are, can very easily make contact with us, and our phone numbers are available there. Uh, we'd love to have them come down and visit us at our farm here on Ninth Drive anytime. It's open. We'd love to walk them through or come to our produce stands on Saturday morning. Excellent. Excellent. You can also find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash green city harvest. Hey, if you've enjoyed this podcast and are interested in listening to my first podcast series, Freshly Green from 2007, you can subscribe to support the Urban Farm podcast. With that, you will have access to Freshly Green and so much more bonus content. Visit urbanfarmpodcast.org to find out more and to pledge your support. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.